Well, good morning and welcome to Calvary Assembly of God. We are blessed that you are here today. Online, we welcome you in the sanctuary. Let's stand together and let's worship the Lord. God bless you in the, in the chapel, in the balcony. Let's look to Jesus this morning for great things. Let's worship him. Oh, yes, he's not only Lord and Savior, but he's our closest friend. As you and I come into God's house this morning, did we come with our heart? Oh, is that important? Oh, yes, because the Bible says that the Lord looks on my heart. It says that in order to Come into the Holy of Holies where He is. He says, I have to have a heart that's been sprinkled from an evil conscience. Oh yes, He says that out of my heart flows every other part of my life. Have you and I come into His heart this morning, uh, His house this morning with a clean heart psalm 73 1 says god is good to his people to those who have a clean heart let's pray together father we come this morning into your house and we come with our hearts O oh lord father we come in truth, Lord, because you look at our hearts, you require that my relationship with you be a heart thing, oh God. And how we thank you for that. How we thank you, Father, that you have loved me and you have called me to love you this morning as I worship you. 
in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, we worship in Jesus' name. This morning as we sing about the name of Jesus, I want you to know you're more than just singing words or a melody. You are singing the name above all names, the name that holds all authority, the name by which we have salvation, the name by which every area of our life must bow its knee and call Him Lord. Would you sing with us this new song entitled, I Speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Oh, your, your name, your name is power your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like fire. I just want to speak His name. I just want to speak the name. Over fear, over fear and all anxiety. To every soul a captive by depression, I speak Jesus. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your Your name is healing. 
Jesus. Jesus. Over fear and all anxiety. To every soul held captive by depression. I speak Jesus. Jesus. I speak Jesus. Jesus. I speak Jesus. I speak Jesus. 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 We honor your name, Jesus. We honor your name. We honor your name. At in the sound of your name. All creation trembles. Powers above and below. Things seen and unseen. Jesus, for you are all things and you hold all things together. Thank you, Jesus, that when we submit to your name, when we bow our knee and call you King and Lord, you come and you send a blessing upon every part of our lives. As Justin leads us in this song entitled, The Blessing, would you know that because of Jesus, all the Father's promises are yes and amen. In fact, it says this, it says, He gave the promises and we say the amen to the glory of God. Let's sing this song together. Sing the Lord. Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Let's sing that again. Come on, I want to hear you this morning. The Lord bless you. The Lord.
thousand generations and your family and your children and your children may his presence go before you and behind us oh around you and within you he is with you in the morning in the morning in the evening in your coming and your going in your weeping and rejoicing he is for you sing in the morning in the morning in the evening in your coming and your going in your weeping and rejoicing he is for you morning in the morning in the evening in your coming and your going in your weeping and rejoicing he is for you 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 blessings of the Lord. They're part of the privilege. They're part of knowing Christ as Savior. The blessings of the Lord don't just kind of fall on us, but they come from listening to the voice of God. God's voice comes through His Word primarily. Have you read His Word this week? You may have missed a blessing because you didn't read your Bible. And your Bible would have given you God's way and God's method and God's direction for the great blessing that he had purposed for your life this week. Read your Bible. Maybe he would have spoken to you by the voice of his Holy Spirit in prayer. Have you prayed this week? Maybe he would have spoken through the Wednesday night Bible study. Were you there? Did you listen to that? Did you listen to the devotions during the day? Did you, did you somehow make yourself available for God to speak and bless you this week? I know this, God is a blessing God. He is a God who <clears throat> provides. He is Jehovah Jireh. But he is the God who waits for you to say, yes, Lord, here I am. You bring your empty basket, he'll fill it. But he can't fill it till you bring it. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are the God that when we sing such a song as the blessing, it can speak of our greatest blessing, our salvation, our eternal life, our peace of heart, just the whole, what goes and happens to a man or a woman, regardless of anything else that's going on around them, what happens inside their spirit and soul. But then, Lord, we are thankful that this blessings of God are so manifold. There are so many, whether we talk of healing or whether we talk of just a dozen and a thousand other things. So, Lord, we thank you. We bless you. We lift up your name today and we affirm the songs that we have worshipped you in 
We affirm that our worship needs to turn into lifestyle. Worship turns into the way we walk and talk and what we think and what we do and what we spend and how we go and where we go. Lord, we thank you. We ask you bless. Now, the blessing of the Lord are rich on the people of God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated in the sanctuary in the balcony there, over in the chapel, and online again, welcome to you. Well, here we are at Calvary Assembly. Thank you, worship team. Uh, you know, you guys really, every week you get better. How do you do it? I don't know. I don't know. Okay. But you do it. Hey, Calvary Assembly is, is the place you're at, and soon I'm going to talk to you about being part of the family of God. But I want to welcome you as the family of God, our church, our family. And thankful that God can speak to you this morning during these months of summer 2021. The fall is around the corner. And boy, after Thursday and Friday, I'm ready for the fall. But actually, it's going to be pretty nice today. Hey, Wednesday nights, we meet at 7 o'clock, encouraging you. Later on in the sermon, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say you ought to be, I think it's a biblical pattern to be at least twice with God's people every week, at least. And that, that's just kind of like as that works in your schedule, but even more than that. On Sunday mornings, we have a 9.30 and 11 o'clock service, and before our 9.30 service is a time of teaching on prayer. It's interesting, some people actually come for the teaching, and then because they prefer the 11 o'clock service, they go out and then they come back for the 11. But I can tell you that by the time we finish September, we're going to have Sunday school also. Hey, I'm going to jump right to the men's breakfast one. I want you to know that men's breakfast is coming up this Saturday, this Saturday. Guys, if you go to calvaryassembly.church, look for the register button, hit that. It gives you a page of, of options to register, and one of them is for men's breakfast. Love to see you there. Register early. Remember, they, they're by Thursday night, they're texting each other. How many we got? What should we buy tomorrow morning? On and on and on. So then guys sign up, you know, 3 o'clock on Saturday morning. Well, it's, it's a little tough to break into into Restaurant Depot and get something. So anyway, encouraging you to sign up just a little bit early. Hey, it's going to happen about three weeks from now, actually four weeks from now, but I want to tell you about a seminar coming up on Buddhism. You might say, Buddhism, what in the world? Why would we need to know about that? Well, listen, now I know we understand Islam and Hinduism are some of the big religions, false religions of the world. We understand that. But did you know that in a close second, if you please, or at least up in that group, is Buddhism? Did you know that Billy Graham has a website where people who are searching for Jesus end up going? There are 200 countries in the world, or over 200 countries in the world, the top 10 countries that hit Billy Graham's website to find Jesus, top 10, three of those top 10 are either majority Buddhists or have a lot of Buddhists in them. That means that Buddhists are searching for peace. That means they need to know. And so I'm going to encourage you for something uniquely different to go to a seminar in one of our Assembly God churches close by, and Mark Keller Quinn's going to kind of head that up. And so there's a sign-up sheet in the back, right in the center. If you'd like to sign and go with this, it's about two hours. It goes from 10 to 12. They're going to give a lunch, so it might go beyond 12 a little bit. They're going to provide a lunch. That's what the $10 is for. But our missionaries who have been there in Cambodia literally for decades now have got a grip on the culture, grip on, the, on what goes on in that religion and how you can use that to leverage that to bring people to Jesus Christ. Can I encourage you to be part of that group? I believe there are a unique number of people at Calvary that this will bless and help them in their witnessing for Jesus. Uh, let's jump right to that final call for the girls' ministry. Girls' ministries... Uh, this is it. Today is it. Psh, psh. We're closing the door. We're locking it. We're, we're turning off the lights. We're pulling down the blinds. Everything else because this is the deadline that our district has given us for our girls to sign up. Happens two weeks from yesterday, but it has to be today that you sign up. So if you were dragging your feet, don't do that right today. Make sure that your girls sign up for that. And we're going to go to our giving time. I want to remind you to be a giver. I want to remind you to be a giver. I, I would... You know, think about this. You, you sit down in a restaurant and you all eat and then you say, okay, now, everyone, if you, if you put something in the middle, then that pays for the bill. And think of half of the people said, no, no, we're just going to eat, but we're not going to do anything about it. And that's not God's plan for the church. God's plan is that he takes and simply asks every person, 
from whatever it, you have been blessed with. If you've been blessed with little, you tithe on little. If you've been blessed with a lot, you tithe on a lot. And so it's not a matter of, of a number in the sense of a, a figure, but it's like maybe some other churches might do, but it's simply a percentage that you say, God, I give the sacred tithe. It's called a sacred tithe, meaning because there's a holiness to it, you give it to God. You can do it one of three ways. You can either do it uh, online, which, we, which we're encouraging you to do in today's world, or you can, of course, send an email, and after service, there's going to be a couple of our guys standing in the back. Thank you. Thank you for your obedience. It always encourages a pastor to say, thank God. I often say this about our missionaries, and that's why I encourage you to give to missions. I say, if they can keep their minds off of finances because they're taken care of, they can get their minds on what they need to be doing, winning people to Jesus Christ. Well, likewise for the church. Hey, I want to give you a small report about India. You know that uh, several weeks ago we put out a plea and asked you as a church to give towards one of the areas called the COVID response because India was going through, I mean, bad times. Not just bad, I mean really bad times. Just bad. And I, and I know they're not even out of the valley yet. But I want to thank you for your response. It was wonderful. And I want to give you encouragement that many other churches were called to do the same thing. And so we could either give through uh, Mission of Mercy in Calcutta and give to, through that area of our very famous missionary, Mark Bentain, or we could give through Convoy of Hope, which is a, which is a wonderful Assemblies of God-based uh, kind of ministry that goes in and provides relief, and we've done both. And so what's exciting is, is that uh, Convoy of Hope just said that they just raised a million dollars, not just our church, of course, anybody here, got, but, but you know, just not only our church, but churches like our, Assemblies of God churches like ours together, pulled together, and we've given a, a million dollars, among other many other relief organizations, but I just want to thank you that you're making a difference. God bless you when you give to missions. Over and over and over again, I'll say this. Um, I, I know this week we are looking to commit towards a orphanage in, in Bangladesh, I, Dhaka, I believe it's in Dhaka. So just over and over and over again, God's people giving take care of our regular missionaries offerings and projects that we can do and touch around the world. You're making a difference. You're making a difference. And I believe that brings purpose to your life. God bless you. Finally, did we happen to find that slide that says our church, our purpose? Ha <laughs> ha, our church, our family. Uh, that has kind of been the theme for the past few weeks, but now today I'm going to preach about it. It's been, you know, talking about it for a while, but now I get the opportunity to preach to you this morning. So please, take out your Bibles. Take out your Bible. Hey, there's one thing I missed there. I'm sorry. Do not take out your Bibles. Did we talk about that? No, we did not. Ah, thank you. And the reason is I didn't have it in my notes, and that's why I forgot it twice. Young adults a week from today, young adults are getting together after the service, having a lunch. They successfully do this. Get such a, in fact, they've, de they've developed a uh, life group also that's uh, probably the most successful life group we have, or right up there at the top. Uh, and they get together, and our missionaries... Uh, Tim and Nicole are coming and sharing with them, and I'm really excited, really excited about our young people getting a heart for missions and getting a heart to do what God calls them to do. So young adults, make sure you see Pastor Josh and Emily about that. It will be next week, literally after this service, starting at one o'clock. Amen. Thank you for not letting me forget that. Now you can go to We Are Family. Oh, we're on. Okay. Are you ready? Now, reach down and see if you can grab the sides of your seats because it's going to get that wild. It's going to be, a, well, I don't know if it's going to be a roller coaster. Maybe it's going to be a roller coaster. Some of these things you're going to go, yeah! And some of these are going to go, ooh! But we're going to ask God to speak to us this morning because we are family. We are family. And why are we family? How is the common denominator that brings us together? Jesus. Because of Jesus, we are called to each other. Family. Family. I don't typically preach this, but I can guarantee I will not be preaching a Joel Olstein type sermon this morning. I can just tell you that right off the bat. It is going to get hot. It's going to get heavy. It's going to be strong in subject matter. I just trust by the end of the sermon, 
you're smiling. You're smiling, you're happy, you're thrilled that God's people were challenged and to stretch and to be more than perhaps they've done, uh, especially in the past 18 months. John, the first chapter, verses 1, cha first chapter, verses 12 and 13. Listen to what it says about people who believe in Jesus, who accept Jesus. This is what happens to a person. Have you believed in Jesus? Have you accepted Jesus? If so, but to all who believed in Jesus and accepted Jesus, God gave the right to them to become children of God. People who receive Jesus as their Savior get bumped into a status called children of God. Children, or what, where, where are children? Where do we find children? In families. In families. They are reborn, born again. Not of a physical birth resulting from a human passion or plan, but this is the born again experience that Jesus told Nicodemus about. In John the third chapter, wrote, a birth that comes from God. We are born, we are family, because of Jesus. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, allow the next few minutes to really get deep into who we are. Lord, because the subject matter is who we are or who we should be. So Lord, I pray in the great name of Jesus that brothers and sisters here today, oh, there we go, brothers and sisters are part of a family, would listen, would apply, would grow, would be excited, literally thrilled with what Jesus is doing. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Once again, we welcome everybody online and everybody in the sanctuary and in the building. Galatians, the third chapter, says these words. It literally helps us understand and defines the sermon title when it says these words. For you are all children of God through faith because of Jesus Christ. You are all children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible declares that we call God our Father. Lord, we don't know what we should pray. Well, pray like this, our Father. The Bible also talks often about how Jesus is our brother. Very interesting uh, description. The Bible talks about how we are to call each other brother and sister. When Jesus came walking out of the tomb on the first Easter Sunday, Mary's there and Jesus says, wait, Mary, wait, wait, wait. I need you to go and talk to the, tell the disciples Go, and this, these are the words Jesus used. He said, go to my brethren, go to my brothers, and tell them I ascend to my Father and your Father. You put all those terms together, that terminology together, and you end up with, you've got to come to this definition. This is called a family. This is called a family. Because of Jesus, we are family. I love that. I, I just, it just does something for me. A family, some of the greatest relationships, if, well, I would have to say the greatest relationships of life typically come out of your family, your greatest relationships, but your, some of your greatest sorrows and disappointments and hurts come out of the very same family. Why, can't, why is that? Why, why would that be? It's simple, because you give your greatest love to those. And when you give your greatest love, it can soar high or it can nosedive and crash and burn. And so that's why I say it can go either way. It can be wonderful or it can break. So one great way to describe your local church is to call it my church family. My church family. Hey. Where do you go to church? Well, my church family is, and then you'd say Calvary Assembly of God. Somebody else might say it's this church or that church. But when you have a local church that God has allowed you to put some roots down in and start to grow with others to produce fruit for the kingdom and bring stability to that local assembly, you should call it, you should get the terminology in your mind, you should let it sink down deep. This is my church family. And I will have some of my greatest blessings here, and potentially, I may have some of my worst hurts here. But that's what family is. So let's see what the church has to say. Let's see what rather the Bible has to say about the church and this great treasure that you and I have called my church family. Number one, number one. 
Number one, we go to 1 Corinthians. The, the letter of 1 Corinthians is written to a Pentecostal church. It was a good church, but not a church without problems. Let me say it again. It was a good church. It was a church that were doing things. It was a church that was, was growing for the, the glory of God. But they were not a church without problems. And they had um, tendencies. You know, here's the deal. Churches have, people have tendencies. And here's a style of preaching that I typically commit to. I can't say I'm perfect in it because I said, I'm going to say there are no perfect pastors. But I can say that my, one, of my, one of my things that I, philosophies that I try to commit to is that I try to make sure that I don't preach a subject when we're right in the middle of the heat of the subject because it may look like I'm preaching to a person or a group. But I let any subjects kind of burn their way and burn out and disappear. And then later down the line, or before the fire ever starts, I say, God, let me preach so that we can either know what to do if that ever happens, or actually avert that ever happening in our assembly. So the first thing I want to talk about, not to say we, we are in disunity, but to say we must strive for unity in our church. That is part of, if we are at the bottom of a cliff, we are climbing to the top of a cliff, and you are working your way up. You are striving. You are climbing. You are moving towards with much effort. We must strive to be unity in our church. Paul writes to them and says, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters. Oh, there it is, brothers and sisters. Family, by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. And rather... Here's what we're striving for, to be of one mind, united in our thoughts, what we think, and the direction, the purpose that we have as a church. So brothers and sisters, because of Jesus, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. That makes us family. And this is a unique family. Why? Because when Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood... It gave us opportunity to have our sins forgiven. And as we said from 1 John 12, uh, verse, chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, when you receive him, when you believe on him, believe on what? The work he did on the cross. When that happens in your life, take note. You are then born again, born into a family that is not just a temporal family, not just a, ah, oh, well, well, we'll hang in there for five years and disband, not a club you are in an eternal family. You have a unique status. Your church family, your the church family, and then you, locally my church family, is an eternal family. Now, now that you know that you're part of a family, let me tell you, not you're part of your home family, you're part of your church family, let me give you a news flash. Are you ready for the news flash? Here we go, headliner, big, big, big letters, here we go. No family is perfect. Did you know it? Hey, let me, let me, maybe, maybe you're missing that. Beep, 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 news flash, news flash. No family is perfect. If you think there are perfect families, you've been watching too much Hallmark. It ain't so. Joe, it ain't so. No family is perfect. I love this. Guy sits in church, folds his arms, starts to scan who's at church. We all do it. We all do it. I'm giving the illustration, but you've done it already this morning four times. You're scanning the church. Might be a lady, might be a guy, might be a kid, might be an older person. We, we, we're great at scanning. And all of a sudden our eyes fix on somebody. A family. Oh, man. In your mind. Wow. They are, they are, they are a perfect family. They are, they are perfect. I wish I could be like that family. I wish my family was like that family. Beep, 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 beep. No perfect families. Here's the irony. Here's the ultimate irony. The family that you are looking at had their arms folded and they're looking over at you. And they're not saying, what a disaster those people are. 
You know what they're saying? What a perfect family. I wish we could be like that family. I wish we could somehow transpose ourselves and, and do something. Listen, it is good for me to point out at this moment in the sermon. In fact, it is very important for me to point out that wishing like that borderlines on, maybe, <clears throat> I, I can't say for sure, but borderlines on envy, jealousy, and coveting. And that always leads to bitterness, so be careful what you wish for. Be careful what you think because no family is perfect. No family is perfect. Yes, we need examples to follow. Yes, it would be nice to have another family that, was, that we couldn't look at. But none of us need idols to worship. None of us need idols to worship. Let me read it again. We need examples to follow, but none of us need idols to worship. Don't, don't worship another family. I can't tell you. I mean, I wish I could. Pastors know things. Sorry. <clears throat> Pastors know things. And it's just, it's amazing what we don't know. And truth is that when things happen in, in our assembly, people base and make decisions on such small amounts of data. And when their pastor stands back and looks at, at what they made their decision on, and he saw this much of the picture and said, if you knew what I know, you wouldn't have made that decision. Folks, if you want to wish for a better family, pray for a better family, then you point your eyes that way, not that way. You say, God, God, there are some deficiencies in this family. Now, I'll tell you, I already know what God's going to say to you. Isn't this amazing? Am I a prophet or what? I can tell you exactly what he's going to say. These are the words he's going to say to you immediately. He can say, I am so glad you asked. Let's start with you. You heard it here first. God will say to you, before he wants to work on your wife, your husband, your son, your daughter, your mom, your dad, anybody else in the family, he will say to you, hey man, gal, we need to get working on you because you're basing so much. I could do so much. God can do so much with a surrendered man or a surrendered woman. And God can do so little without a surrendered man or a surrendered woman. So let's surrender to him and say, yes, everybody said amen. Praise the Lord. What, a, what good preaching here. So I have a liberating truth for you this morning. Here it is. You are free. Born free. Here you go. You are free. There are no perfect churches. There are no perfect pastors. Well, almost. No, there are no perfect pastors. There are no perfect people. You, don't, you are not perfect this church is not perfect. This pastor is not perfect. There's none of us that are perfect here. And when you realize that, and when you realize it's for your house and it's for your church, and you're not going to abandon your house and you're not going to abandon your church, then the reality of it is you're going to deal with imperfect people every week. Every single week. People with imperfections are going to be all around you. And that's, hey, remember what Jesus said? Every time you see an imperfection in another person, take the size of their imperfection, multiply it by 100, and that's what you've got. You'll look for the speck in their eye while you've got a log hanging out of your own eye. Why? You might say, I'm not going to make a doctrine out of this, but I don't know. I could preach a sermon on this one. You might say God gave you imperfect people to show you what you look like. I told you it wasn't going to be Joel Osteen. I just told you. You weren't listening. You weren't listening. But I told you it was not going to be, for sure. People of imperfections. So, if that be in the case of a church, then another way of what Paul said in 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, was we need to strive for unity. Another way to say that is striving for unity. Striving for unity. There it is. There it is. Let me say it another way. If you are allowing your local church to be your local church, to be your local family, then here is my guarantee to you. Not too many guaranteed things in the world today, but look at this. I offer you 100% guarantee. If you are letting Calvary Assembly of God 
be your church family, then I guarantee you sooner or later somebody's going to offend you. Sooner or later, you're just going to be standing there with your foot out and they are going to see it and step on it or maybe accidentally step on it. But you are going to get your toes crushed sooner or later. Why? Because it's called family. It's called family. And if you don't think it should happen, you will become highly offended. You, oh, oh. Now, on the other side of the coin, let me say this. Would you watch out not to step on somebody else's feet? Would you, you clod hopper, would you please watch where you are walking? Would you not just walk around and stomp on everybody's feet that you can get close to or, or just do the, the jig or something so you're just stepping on people? Take control of yourself. Now, I'll say it on that side of the coin, but I'm pretty much preaching to the people who are going to get offended. And when I say that to you, I want you to rise above that. I want you to get off the low road of what that offense makes your heart feel like, and I want you to rise up to the high road because Christians walk the high road. Can anybody say amen? We're not the low road. Just because they did it doesn't mean we do it. Just because they slapped you doesn't mean you have to slap them. Just because they offended you, you are called to forgive. Give the other cheek. Whoa. What is that called? It's called Christianity. That's called being a Christian. So I'm about to give you, and, and just in case, if you need a spoiler alert, I'm going to give you some highly volatile words that have offended phrases that have offended people in the past 18 months. Are you ready? Now's the time to grab a hold of your chair. They have torn brother, these phrases have torn brothers and sisters and churches and our country apart. And God's people need to rise above. Vaccinations, masks, George Floyd, Democrats, Republicans, Black lives matter, police lives matter, all lives matter, capitalism, socialism, Trump, Biden, and I want to throw in Bernie, and conspiracies, and the beat goes on, and the beat goes on. And in fact, I probably forgot one, and somebody's getting offended right now. Well, oh, you didn't put that in there. Why? What's, what's going on? How, how can that be? There's got to be something that has a higher priority than these. And it is the love that we have for the family of God. That's why people in your family, though they highly offend you, you don't throw them out the window or throw the baby out with the bathwater, as they say. No, instead, admit it. Those words that I just said, I'm telling you, they cause emotions to rise up within. I said them, and you, and you were feeling, you look good on the outside because you're very controlled people. I'm surprised you're Pentecostals. But, uh, you know, you're very controlled on the, in, you know, outwardly. But inwardly, man, emotions rise up in us, in our souls. That's where emotion comes from. And if we become driven by our soulish emotions, we're going to go the wrong direction. We need to be driven, led by the Holy Spirit. Can anybody say amen? If there's anything that has a higher priority than dwelling in unity, it's got too high a priority. Because when it does have a higher priority, it will divide the house of God, and a house divided cannot stand, hence it is destroyed. Not good, not good at all. Here's an interesting one that even Paul said. Paul didn't pick any of the things that I said. He picked the subject of tongues. Now, to Pentecostals, you just can't get more close to the heart than the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit because it, it, it's just our identification with the New Testament. We don't deny those. We don't put them in a different, what they sometimes call dispensation or something. We say they're here, they are now, they're God's hand present today. When you talk about tongues... Paul, in the same letter that he wrote to, to the Corinthians, said these words. He said, you know about tongues. He said, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, if I'm as Pentecostal as, and I'm just woe, I'm woe, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, yet have not love, then here's the deal about me. I am totally worthless. I am a sounding gong. I am a tinkling symbol. I have no melody. I have no, I have no beauty. I have nothing. You see, he said of that subject, love has to trump that. 
in any subject in the house of God, with the people of God, our love for each other in Christ. They shall know that you are Christians by your love one for another. Here's what it's, what we, I'm going to put it this way. We should say to each other, my family of God and love for you is going to exceed everything else in my life. That means you're going to have, at times, swallow hard, zip it up, everything else. John 15, 13, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Let me give you a non-COVID example about my own life. Here's a non-COVID example about my own life. I was born in a year that Dwight Eisenhower would be elected to his second term. We're going back now. Dwight Eisenhower was the president who, in fact, was the general, one of the very significant generals that brought about the defeat of Nazism and Japan during the World War II and why we have freedom today. So you might say that this guy is born in the era of and grew up in the era of being patriotic. Hey, I was born when there were only 48 stars on the flag. Whoa, whoa, what happened there? And my parents never got a new flag, so we had, you know, 50 states and 48 flags on our... Uh, that was a funny story, but anyway. So here we are. You're talking to a guy who's patriotic, and so you just, don't, you just don't take that out of your mind. But there's a struggle here going on with me. Because am I, am I a Christian or am I an American? And if America goes this way... And Jesus goes this way, then I'm going to have to go with Jesus. I got to go with the Word of God. I got to go with what Jesus asked me to do, no matter how much it is ingrained inside of me this way. And the country that I love, Jesus takes numero uno all the time. Can anybody say amen? For any of us in any subject. Wow, that was great. That was only point number one. Good night, it took him a half an hour to, well, not quite, but anyway, it took him way too long for point number one, so now you get a mini two and three. Number two, I will fully attend my church, Hebrews 10, 25. Not forsaking or neglecting to assemble together as believers, as the habit of some is. Take note that this verse is typically used to say to people, or pastors to say to people, hey, you can't just be skipping church. That doesn't work. That's not good. But I want us to see the second half of the verse. Because the second half of the verse says, once you don't skip church, once you get your body into church, or watching online as it were, then take note of this. What they're going to do when they get you there is they're going to warn you, urge you, and encourage you, one another, and all the more faithfully as we see the day of Jesus' second coming approaching us. The Bible talks to us, yes, about our association, our close association, with the house of God, the local church, the flock is a good way to say it, or the family. Just like you should in your family, you go different ways, but there must be regular times that come together or you're not even a family. If, if, if the family never comes together, what right do you have to call it a family? Can't be, will not be. So if we look at the book of Acts, which we mentioned before, it gives us examples. You read about how they got together on the first day of the week and you read how they got together and broke bread, and they prayed, and all different things. You come up with at least, at the very least, you come up with the calculation that they met at least twice a week, if not more. And so I believe it would be proper for me to say that the example of the Bible is that the New Testament Christians did their best with, to meet with God's people at least twice a week. And then we go to the second half of Hebrews 11.25, because that's when he said, when they meet together, then the word, the teaching, the preaching, the worshiping, the loving of each other and of God takes place. This is good. This is good. This is really good, in fact. That's why Paul said in Romans, the 10th chapter, he said, how do you expect people to get saved if nobody ever preached the gospel to them? How can they believe if they have never heard? So I would just simply take that and massage it a little bit and say, hey, how can you ever obey God in new areas if you never heard the preaching of the word? How to obey God? That's why it's so important to be under the word of God. And that happens in the context of a church. So what should happen in a church? What is the goal of coming together as a family 
in the church? Well, there's four primary ones. Four. Here we go. We must ask ourselves, what is the goal of going to church? The goal is, number one, worship God. Number two, pray. Number three, hear and obey. I can't be hearers of the word of God, not doers, or you'd mess up the whole sequence there. And finally, worship with Jesus lovers. Other people. Fellowship, I should say. That says fellowship with Jesus lovers. And here's the sad thing. Here's the ouch. Ooh. Sometimes we come to church. We walk in that front door. We walk up those stairs. We walk, we sit in that chair. And we go through all the time we are here. And we finish, and we walk back out the same doors, out the front door, to our car, and we never even do one of these, yet alone all four. The call of the sermon is to purpose in your heart when you walk in the front door. Why am I here? What should happen? What's the goal? Be stupid to go to the grocery store, push the cart around for two hours, and walk out the door with nothing. What, 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 the, what was that all about? What were you thinking? What's the goal of the house of God? Worship God. When you come in, they're going to sing songs. That provides an atmosphere. I know you got a lot of things on your mind. I know you can't carry a tune in a bucket. But still, the Lord loves... A, what is, what's, the, what's the word? Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Make a joyful noise. Just make something. If you're, if you're only making a joyful noise, keep it down to a little dull roar. You know, the rest of us like, you know fingernails on a chalkboard, but, uh, but definitely make your joyful noise because you cannot come to the house of God without worshiping God. You cannot, you must not. I must not, you must not. God, you are great, you are wonderful. I speak it in song, I speak it in adoration. I speak it in, in giving you glory. I worship God, pray. Now I realize not every service is, is around the altar prayer time, but there are numbers of times we pray in a service, before a service and after a service. When that happens, give yourself to prayer. If, if, if somebody gets up and starts praying, that's not your two minutes to wander off someplace else. Oh, what am I, what am I what's going on? What's the score? Mets? What? What? You know, something like that. That's not your job. No, your job is to agree with what they're praying for. God, I pray your Holy Spirit comes, says the prayer. Then you as the prayee says, yes, God, I agree. Send your Holy Spirit. God, touch our families. Help them have health. Yes, I agree, God, by your stripes we are healed. You are agreeing. You are praying in the house of God. Number th three, and that's the obvious one, hear the word of God and obey the word of God. So it's almost like you're saying, so you walk up to somebody, what are my instructions? And they give you the instructions, you walk away and you do nothing. Don't you remember the, don't you remember the parable Jesus told of the son and said, Dad, what do you want? He says, I want this. He said, I'll do it, Dad, and walked away and did nothing. The other one said, what do you want, Dad? He said, I want you to do this. I'm not doing that. And he walked away and did it. And actually, the guy who did it but said no was of higher quality than the guy who said yes and did nothing. Come and say yes and do it. I think that's good preaching. I think that's a good way to say it. And finally, and finally, in a post-almost COVID world, almost, I said, fellowship with somebody. You know, I think people have started wearing sneakers to church to see how fast they can get back out to their cars. <laughs> On your marks. Get set. He said, amen. <laughs> out the door. You know, I don't know if Guinness World Book of Records has a record for the quickest a person got out of church after the end to their car. And I won't say that people at Calvary are like in running to get that, but they're close. Make sure that you stop and you actually make eye contact with some, hi, not hi, bye, but you make, and then ask them an open-ended question. You may get stuck listening to their answer. And before it's over, you've had fellowship. Oh, God bless you when you come to the house of God and do all of these because this is the house of God. This is the family of God. You could, you could write what a family should be. 
They play games together. They have goals together. They, they do things together. They eat together, whatever. You know, they, they, they sacrifice for each other. On and on and on. They cooperate. You put all those to a regular family and that's what you get. Well, likewise for a church. This is, this is what you get. Okay, I need, to, I need to go fast, real fast now. You see, in today's world, you see, in today's world, and I'll just put it this way, we think that if we go to the internet and quickly watch some guy that's a thousand miles from here, or even more, we go to a Facebook and get a snippet, we get a 30 second clip of a guy with the words going across the bottom and, and the picture shaking like this or something, that somehow we have, we have met the, the goal of being fed from the word of God that week. And so it's been said, it's been said clearly that, especially of, of younger people, but really all of us, that a lot of people want preachers, but they don't want shepherds. What's the difference between a preacher and a shepherd? Well, anybody can preach online, but they can't be your shepherd. Only your shepherd of your local church, your family, can be your shepherd. Others can help, sure. But like in a family, there's a mom and a dad. If you had 30 of them, that's not going to work. There's got to be, you know, some, somebody has to kind of set standards and, and, and be the, the, where the buck stops and everything else. And on and on. You see, in today's world, they want preachers, they just don't want shepherds. But shepherds are going to say to you, hey, hey, what are you doing there? They're going to say to the flock, you're wandering. They're going to say, man, you are in dangerous territory. They're going to say, you're eating the wrong grass, you're drinking the wrong water, you're straying. They will say things guaranteed you do not like to hear. How do you know you have a shepherd? He says things you don't like to hear. Oh, man. You know, I know, again, on the outside, you just smile. That's a really good preaching. I hate you. <laughs> you know, it's just, there are things we don't like to hear. What, what, we don't, none of us don't have some, something inside of us that, does anybody like to be corrected? I know the Bible calls us to it and says wise men will want to be corrected, but boy, I'll tell you, that's a hard verse to follow. Because when somebody corrects me, I'm like, well, okay, fine. You know, it's tough. It's tough. It takes a while. It takes a little praying through. You see, when your pastor, your local shepherd senses you are following carnal desires rather than God's holy word, he's probably going to tell you. And then you're not going to like it. And then some people get offended and they go someplace else or something like that. So many people want to hear God's voice, but they don't want to do what God has to say. Isn't that interesting? Or they want to hear God's voice, so they do what they want to do, and then they call it God. Here's, an, here's a saying that's not original with me. It's hard to hear God's voice when you've already decided what you want him to say. That was worth the price of the ticket this morning. Right there. So hard. Number three and finished. Number three and finished. I will give myself at church. I will give of myself at church. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider what great things he has done for you. Samuel said this to the nation of Israel as he was leaving. There are many cases, there are many reasons for people having depression. Why do some people... Now, there's a lot of reasons. And I, I'm, I am not Joe Clinical Psychologist up here telling you all the reasons. I'm not your appointed psychiatrist, but I'll tell you one reason people get depressed is because they live selfishly. They just live for self. And self-living, selfish living will implode. You will crumble from the inside out. Selfish people are never long-term happy people. They are happy that they got their toy for the moment but next week they're not happy anymore because toys don't bring peace and joy and life. God's way, God's methods do, and God's methods are to serve. So the only way to get out of our selfish living is to serve others. Serve others. Best way to serve others I've ever found, not just short-term or temporal ways, but long-term, even with eternal results, is through the local church. I recommend to you that you make yourself available to serve God in and through your local church. You do it. You say, oh, but I'm, I'm, wait, you're part of a family. People in a family share responsibility. It just, it, it should not work the other way. So let me give you an example. Consider the household where 
only one member of the family does all the work and the rest of the family just sits and does nothing. Ever seen a family like that? Ever seen a person who does that? Yeah, she's typically called mom. It's usually mom. If there's a household where only one member does all the work and everybody else sits back and, you know, and flips up the lazy boy, I'm telling you, that person is mom. Oh, but we have Mother's Day. We love you, mom. Here's a dozen roses. They cost way too much, but here they are. You know, we love mom one day a year. And then the rest of the year, in some families, we are so selfish. So this pastor will say to you, if you let your mom do all the work in your family, I'm, I'm reaching down, grabbing your emotions for the moment. If you let your mom do all the work in your family, then I'm just calling you right to your face, selfish. You are not honoring the fourth commandment, which is honor thy father and mother, and because she's the first lady of the house, I would, I would not only say that's good for moms, but I would say that's good for wives also. That a wife, because she's typically, she is and technically the first lady of the house also, so for moms and wives, they should not be doing all the work. Some of the work, we all do, we're part of the family, but not all of the work. So, I'm just gonna say this very plainly. You are destroying your family if you let her do all the work. You are destroying your family. Never demote mom to status of maid, nanny, house cleaner, cook, Uber driver, or concubine. None of them. When I say that about mom, when I said all that, when I said that, every person in the room got it. I get what you're saying, Pastor. I, get, I had a guy come up to me after service. Now, that's only my example. And that was the best part of the service for him. He said, man, I'm changing things in my house. That was, that was what he said. So that's how deep. I mean, I, I preach like all this sermon, and this is the part that really got him. You know? But that's okay. That's okay. That's the way sermons are. There's going to be a part that gets you. So if that's for a home family, then what about a church family? That, there's an exact match there. You can't let everybody else work in your family, your church family, and you do nada. That cannot be. That, would, that should not be. You can't let somebody else do the work of the house of God. You must put your hand to the plow. Hang on. I just dropped a pin and I heard it. You can't let someone else give of their sacred tithe. They're 10% sacred tithe, but somehow you're excused. Somehow you're excused from giving it. You see, when we don't do our share, when we don't do what a family does for a family, we actually start to ruin the family, destroy the family, crumble the family, make it at best dysfunctional. What can we do? Ah, there's so much more to say. Time's up, time to go home. Worship team, would you come in, please? Thank you. As I close this sermon, the older I get, the 48-star flag, the older I get, this I realize. My greatest treasure in life, my greatest treasure, number one, is my own family. My wife, my children, my grandchildren. So I say that plainly. That's my greatest treasure. But then I'm going to say, Second, second among my greatest blessings, and I'm going to say it this way, a very close second. A very close second is the great treasure in my life called my church family. You folks, my local church. I'm part of this church, my local family of God. I am thankful for you people. You are my treasure. You are wonderful. You are my wealth of living. You are the prize of life, my church family. We all should look at each other that way. How sad that a person would associate with the church but not have that rich treasure in their own lives. I don't want you to miss that. That's why I preach this message to you this morning. Don't miss your treasure. Don't miss what God has for you. We are family because of Jesus. So stay united, 
Stay faithful deeply in all the areas of the family and serve in the family. And then what will you get? You will reap the great benefits that only members of God's family, the local church, get. May God bless you and your family. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we wrap up this sermon and we simply ask that as we bow our heads, that we would take what you have allowed to be preached this morning and take especially unique points of it and apply it to unique points of our lives. Lord, some people may say, I, I, I get this part and I do this part, but I've missed that part and I haven't excelled in that part. Lord, regardless of what it is, I pray that you minister to every person. How thankful this pastor is that there can be 200 people in a sanctuary and yet one sermon preached and touches people 200 different ways. So Lord, touch as needed. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to ask you as an individual, simply respond to the Holy Spirit according to what you have felt today, according to what you have heard and clicked with you. And God will greatly bless you through it. He is the God of blessing, remember that. Now, Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your ministry. We thank you how you have touched us and helped us. And Lord, we thank you for the family. We thank you for these people. Thank you, Jesus. They're, they're our blessing. They're our treasure. They're our family. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, God bless you this morning. Thank you for being here. I'm glad you're here today online. Thanks for being here. We'll see you all Wednesday night. Hey, don't run out the door now. Fellowship with somebody. Get the whole four done. God bless you.